This is Coding Math, Episode 39, Verli Integration, Part 4. Let's jump right in and add some exciting features to our budding Verli physics engine. The first thing I want to look at is pinning. This is basically just making a point immovable. With this, you can have things like chains that seem to be attached permanently to an invisible wall, and objects can hang and swing from them. Let's do it. I've gotten rid of all the forms and images and reset all the sticks to their default styles. I left that support stick hidden though. I'm going to add a few more points here, starting at 550 on the x-axis, then 400, then 250. These will be points 4, 5, and 6 in the points array. I'll then create some sticks that will connect those points. One stick will connect points 4 and 5, the next 5 and 6, and the final stick will connect points 6 and points 0, the top corner of the box. Let's run this and see what we get. Okay, we have a box with some sticks flopping off the end of it. Fair enough. Kind of neat, but not what we're after. On to the pinning. We'll just create a property called pinned on point 4 and set it to true. And that will magically just make everything work. No, of course it won't. We'll have to do it ourselves. Pinning means that nothing will be able to change the position of this point. Thus, it will have no physics, and sticks will not be able to adjust it. So let's go into Update Points, and make sure that we don't update the pinned points. We'll just break the vars here after getting P, and say, if not P pinned. If it's not pinned, then we'll get the VX and VY and do the rest. You probably saw the misplaced semicolon in the earlier code too, I fixed that. There's one more coming up though. Now if the point is pinned, all of this other stuff in the loop will be skipped. We'll also do the same thing in constrained points. It's unlikely that any pin points would ever need to be constrained, but by filtering them out we avoid a little bit of math. And then finally, down here in update sticks, just before we adjust each point, we'll check to make sure that it's not pinned. Technically, we could get a little bit more fancy here. We have an overall offset needed to move the points to the correct distance, and we're adding half of that offset to each point. So if we're not moving one of those points, we really should be moving the other point double to make up for that. But in practice, it's all going to work out just fine, especially if you're running a few iterations. Each iteration will bring it closer to the final length. Let's see what we have now. Nice, a swinging chain. This pinning is totally dynamic too. I'm going to throw in a click handler here. Inside that, I'm going to toggle the pin state of point 4. If it's pinned, unpin it. If it's unpinned, pin it. I'll run that. And our box is swinging, and then I click. And it all comes crashing down. I can click again and it repins wherever it happens to be. Click again and it unpins. I'm happy with that and I'm sure you can take that all kinds of places. Next up, let's add some motion. Yeah, I know it's already moving, but let's give the system some energy of its own with some driven parts. We'll keep the same setup we have, but I'll comment out that click handler. Now point 4 is pinned, so its location is not going to be touched by any of the Verlay code. But that doesn't mean it has to be static. We can move it with some other code. For instance, we can move it back and forth using some trig. I'll add a couple of new variables. Angle, set to 0, and speed, set to 0 0.1. Then down in update, before I update the points, I'll say points 4x equals 500 plus math cosine of that angle times 50. And then I'll add speed to angle. This will cause the x position of point 4 to oscillate back and forth from 450 to 550. Let's take a look. And there it is, sliding back and forth, shaking up the rest of the system as well. Now this is just a box hanging off a string, but you could use this to create any kind of mechanical device. Think of a railroad train with the wheels attached by a rod. One wheel is powered, that moves the rod, which turns another wheel. You can actually do this quite easily with this setup. Now let's abstract this. We don't really need a point that gets ignored by all the other point code. 
Instead, let's make a special object called an engine. This will encapsulate the base position, range, angle, and speed. I'll remove point 4 here. And up top, I'll remove angle and speed and replace those with an engine object. This will have a base X of 450, a base Y of 100, a range of 100, angle of 0, speed of 0 0.05, and we'll set it up with an initial XY of 550, 100, what point 4 originally had. Let's also make sure that we set it to be pinned so that the sticks don't try to mess with it. Now, although this is not a point object in the points array, it meets all the criteria of a point that can be used to create a stick. It has an X, a Y, and it is pinned. So down in this stick here, where we were using point 4, we'll just substitute engine. Now, a drawback to the way we're dealing with points here is that it's all based on array indexes, which gets kind of ugly when we mess up the order like we just did. When we remove point 4, point 5 became point 4, and point 6 became point 5, so we'll have to fix all these in the last few sticks. Okay, now down in update, we'll get rid of this junk and call update engine. And then we'll create this update engine function. This does the same thing the other code did, but all the properties are now encapsulated in the engine object. Ideally, you'll probably want to make this function a method of the engine object, so you can just say engine.update. And it could address all the properties with this. Finally, rather than just having this thing moving around in space, let's see the engine. I'll add in a call and update to render engine. And I'll create that function. This will draw a box from base x minus range to base x plus range, and it will be 5 pixels either side of base y. And then I'll draw a small circle right at the current x, y point. Now while I was recording this, it came to my attention that I'd set base y wrong, so let's go up and fix that. Should be 100. It's easier to let you see the occasional mistake than re-recording the whole thing. Now let's take a gander. Not bad, not bad at all. Of course, we could easily convert this into a circular engine. In update engine, we just deal with the y-axis by calculating that with sine. And in render engine, we'll draw an arc to represent the engine instead of a box. And bam, we have a circle engine. Of course, these are only a couple of possibilities. You could have vertical engines, oval engines, sine wave engines, however you want to move that X and Y around. Anything attached to it will move right along with it. You could easily have multiple engines. Just put them in an engines array and update them and render them in loops. You could even have movable engines with a base X and Y are attached to one form and can move along with it, but the X and Y move something else. I'm just going off here. There are too many possibilities to explore here. Just go wherever it takes you. The last thing I want to address with this engine is the separation of the logic and data. Right now, everything is in one big file. It's a total mess. Eventually, you're going to want to abstract the engine into a nice reusable library. And you're probably going to want to save the models separately on a server somewhere and load them in dynamically. To do that, you need some way to serialize the models. Well, they're all basic JavaScript objects, so they're a perfect candidate for turning into JSON with just a few tweaks. Now, I'm reverting back to an earlier state here. I get rid of all the engine stuff, and we just have one pinpoint and a swinging box. I've made a new empty file called model.json. In that, I'll create a single root object element and add an array for points and one for sticks. Don't forget that in JSON, properties need to be quoted. Now I'm going to go back to the script and cut out all the lines that push points and sticks onto their respective arrays. And paste them down to the bottom of the JSON file. Now I'm going to go one by one and copy those objects into the respective arrays. This is just grunt work, so I'll speed it up a bit. Now I'll do a bit of searching and replacing to put quotes around most of those properties. Sublime Text is pretty good at telling us what is not valid JSON. Okay, we've got most of that done, 
and now there's a few things left to clean up manually. The first point is using math.random here, which obviously we can't do in JSON, so that has to go. I'll just make the old X and Y a bit different to give it some initial velocity. Okay, that cleans up the points. The sticks have a few more problems. First of all, the length property is calling the distance function. No good in JSON. We'll just get rid of that altogether and calculate it when we get the JSON in and parse it in the code. And the points that make up the sticks are using array notation to access points. Another no-no in JSON. The important part here, though, is the index. So we'll just get rid of all that other stuff and leave the index for each point. Then a bit of final cleanup, removing some commas and a missed quote. And bam, we have valid JSON. Now one thing I would recommend here is giving each point an ID, like so. This is much better than relying on indexes. As you recall, when we removed one point, we had to re-index all the sticks after that. If you were using IDs here, you wouldn't have that problem. Of course, you would have to add the code to find each point by its ID, but overall it will be much more robust. Now I'm not actually going to use IDs here, but again, I highly recommend it if you're building out a full engine. Now to load this JSON, I'm going to stoop to using jQuery. I've already added it into the HTML document, so we can jump into the code here and use it. First I'm going to remove this called update because we don't want to start updating anything until we have all the data loaded in. Then I'll call jQuery get JSON, passing in the URL to the model JSON. Realize that this will all have to be done on a server. XML HTTP requests will not work on a local file system. This will get a success function that gets past the parsed JSON. For now, let's just log it so we know what we have. We run that, again, on either a local host or a server somewhere on the web, and look at the console. And sure enough, we have an object that has seven points and eight sticks. So far, so good. Now back in the code, we can replace that console.log call with a call to parse model, passing in the data. We'll loop through the data points and assign each point to our main points array. Those are no problem. Then we'll loop through the sticks. We'll have to convert each point index into an actual point object. Initially, s.p0 is an integer representing the array index. We'll use that to get the point out of the points array and assign it back to s.p0. Then we can quickly calculate the length of the stick with the distance function and push that stick onto the stick array. Now this isn't all the most elegant code. I'm sure you want to do something much cleaner, but you get the point of what we're doing. Now that our model is being loaded and parsed, we can kick off the action by calling update. And we're back to a swinging box. Well, I hope you'd enjoy the series. I know it was a lot of fun for me and I've given you a ton of information. But there's lots of work left for you to do. I look forward to seeing what you do with it. One thing you might want to try is building a graphical point and stick editor. I've done this a few times myself, and it's uh, actually a lot of fun. Okay, see you next week.